invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Well, some of you, I think, know that I began my career here at Chapel Street as youth pastor in 1986. And during the seven and a half years or so that I was in student ministries, I was always looking for games or activities that, uh, that would help the students have fun, uh, that would keep them interested. And if, and if they learned something through them, that was even better. And one of the games I tried several times um, involved blindfolding a student and having them try to navigate through a maze that we created. So I would get one volunteer, set them up on the side, blindfold them, and then I would, uh, we would set up the whole room, like a room this size, with chairs and tables, anything we could find to create kind of a maze. And at the end of that maze, there would be a prize, like a candy bar or a bag of Skittles or something. You know, students would do anything for a bag of Skittles. And, uh, and, and then we'd, we'd line all the other students up in a circle around the maze, maybe 30, 40, 50 kids. And their job was to shout uh, directions to the person trying to go through the maze. But their job was to try to confuse them and to is yell out the wrong way to go, turn left, turn left, and they really should turn right, and so forth. And then I'd pick one student who was supposed to always give the correct instructions. And the, 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 the job of the student blindfolded was to learn to discern the one voice that was telling them the truth about where they should turn. And it usually descended into utter chaos, screaming and yelling and tipping things over. And, but I did learn something in doing that several times. And I, well, here's what I learned. That when the student uh, chosen to tell the truth, to give prop correct directions was a friend of the student to blindfold on and they could recognize their voice, they would almost always eventually zero in on it and find the right way and they could block out all the other voices. But if the voice of the person telling the truth was an unknown person, the, the student blindfolded did not know their voice, they almost always got lost and never did make it to the, the bag of Skittles. And that's kind of what our current sermon series is about. Uh, we're in a series from the book of Colossians called All Things. And you remember the Apostle Paul is writing uh, this letter to a small church in a city called Colossae, modern-day Turkey, and because he's heard great things about the, these new believers in Christ. And he's heard them th from their pastor, a man named Epaphras. But he also knows that they're being confused by all kinds of voices in their culture. And so he writes this extraordinary letter to encourage them in their faith, to let them know he's heard about them, he's praying for them, and he wants to remind them uh, that Jesus is above all things. Now, before we jump into our text for today, I want to go back to our, our uh, memory verses that Allie already had us read together. Uh, Jeff has been pushing us as a church family to try to memorize these verses. Uh, Jeff likes to memorize things. He's good at it. Um, but I want to find out how good you are at it. So we're going to put the verse on, on, on the screen, and I've left out some words. I'm going to read through it with you, and I want you to fill in the blanks with me, okay? See how many of the words you can get. Let's see how, 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 how well you've worked on this. Ready? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created. Good, good, good. Three for three so far. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. That was easy. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. The earlier service got those two wrong too, because it's through, by, in, for, they're all similar. Um, in him, or for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Good, you guys got a slightly higher score, maybe 90% than the first group. So that's how you memorize. You just keep going over and over until the words are natural. And my guess is that the, that the main thing we take out of this is he is before all things. Now, our assignment today um, is enormous. It's huge. It's like actually impossible. We're gonna be, I'm going to be reading through 29 verses from Colossians. The last six verses of chapter 1 and the first 23 verses of chapter 2. This is the way Jeff broke it out, and I got to sign this text. <laughs> so if today is really confusing, just tell Jeff about it, okay? Don't tell me about it, because he assigned it to me. But we're going to work our way through it. So I'm going to read all these verses. So there's going to be a lot of words sometimes. Hang in there with us 
with me, and I'm going to stop and teach so you understand, and then we're going to pull out the main things we need to take from what Paul says today. So, beginning in, beginning in Colossians 1, chapter, uh, ch chapter 1, verse 24, Paul writes, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I'm going to pause there. What does Paul mean by this? It, it, is he saying that something about Jesus suffering on the cross was not sufficient, like it wasn't enough? Well, no, because other places he says it was enough. So what's he saying? And most scholars think what Paul is trying to say here is, I want, he's in prison, and th these people know he's suffered. He says, I want you to see in me the suffering of Christ for you so you can know something of his love for you. That's what he's trying to say. Verse 25, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery We'll come back to that word that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. Now, remember uh, the issue of the Gnostic teachers, these philosophers. They were saying that true spirituality is found in a kind of secret knowledge available only to sort of the intellectual elite. Paul says, no, 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 no. The mystery of God's truth has been made known. You don't have to be among the elite. You don't have to be a PhD. He's made it known. Verse 27, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Remember, the Gnostics like to talk a lot about wisdom, so Paul co-ops their word uh, and applies it to the gospel, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. I'm going to stop there again. Notice the little, little word in. It's, a, it's an enormously significant word when Paul writes. Because he's telling the Colossians that the gospel is not knowing things about God. It's not knowing things about spirituality. It's not knowing things about philosophy. The gospel is about maturity in Christ. It's a different thing. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you. And for those at Laodicea, another small city nearby, and for all who have not met me personally. Now, this is Paul's way of telling the Colossians how he's praying for them. Remember, he started off the letter saying, I'm praying for you, these things. He says, I'm contending for you. That word means I'm fighting for you in prayer. Now, what kind of prayer is that? If you're a parent today, uh, my guess is this is how you pray for your kids. You fight for your kids. You contend for them. This is how Paul is praying for this church that he's never met in person. It's a beautiful description. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments, for though I am absent from you in the body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Okay, the first thing we're going to talk about here is the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ, what does Paul mean? Well, if I ask you to list out the great mysteries of the world, what are some of the things that would come to mind? Would you think about Stonehenge, for example? Anybody here ever been to Stonehenge? Yeah, there's several in the first service, too. I've not been. I'd love to go sometime. But Stonehenge, as you know, is in England. It's an ancient formation of huge stones. I mean, 13 feet tall, 25 tons each. Stonehenge dates back some 5,000 years. Uh, scholars believe it was, it was begun around 3,000 years before Jesus was born and took some 1,500 years, years to construct. So what was it for? Is it an ancient burial site? Is it an astronomical calendar? Who built it? How did they move those stones way back then without cranes and so forth? Was it the Druids? Was it Celtic priests? Was it the aliens? Yeah, I watch those shows too. You know, aliens. Or maybe the Nazca lines in Peru. Anybody seen these? They're hard to see because you, you have to sort of fly over them. These are these huge, intricate patterns that are carved into the earth. They're called geoglyphs. Uh, they're, they're over a half mile across, visible only from mountains nearby or from airplanes or helicopters. They're lines cut into the ground that form stylized shapes, like this hummingbird here, or there's, there's a spider, there's fish, there's a llama, uh, there's a monkey, even there, there's even human shapes. But who made these? Why did they make them? Are they for agricultural purposes? Some sort of religious ritual, superstition? 
where they created, um, they were created some 500 years BC. Again, maybe aliens, who knows? What about the Loch Ness Monster? Is there a giant prehistoric reptile living in a lake in Scotland? Yes, no, maybe. Or maybe the greatest mystery of our modern world, why can't the Bears find a quarterback? <laughs> I know it's a little mean-spirited, but you know, like really, come on. Verse 25. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Twice Paul uses the word mystery, three times in the passage we're reading today. The Greek word translated mystery uh, is mysterion, which sounds a lot like our word, and it meant hidden or secret. It was used by the Gnostic philosophers to mean secret spiritual knowledge, like I said before, known only to the, the intellectual elite of society. Paul here takes their word and co-opts it. He says, no, 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 he fills it with new meaning. He says, when he says mystery, he means uh, the eternal truth of God's will that has already been revealed. It's already been made known. It's no longer a secret. Three things about this mystery he says here. First, the mystery is Christ. See, Jesus reveals the nature and purpose of God. That's why we're memorizing that passage from Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God. The mystery of all time, of all creation, has been made known. It's him. He is the firstborn of all creation. By him all things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. In him all things hold together. The mystery is that the God who created the entire universe, the God who even now holds all things together, did not, is not removed from this world, as the Gnostics taught. Remember, the Gnostics taught that spiritual things could never enter this world because this world is physical and evil. No, that God who created all things actually did not stay removed, but came into himself the brokenness of this world in human flesh. As Jesus, who was really born, his birth documented in human history, your, license, your driver's license who, that has the date on it, it speaks to his birth. Your license plate speaks to his birth. We count the years from his birth. Who really lived, who really died on the Roman cross, again, his death documented in history. Who rose again from the dead, the resurrection, one of the most documented events in all of human history. And he did all those things to prove that he is the image of the invisible God himself. Christ is the mystery. Secondly, the mystery is also that salvation is for everyone. Verse 27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, that's Gentiles is all non-Jewish peoples of the world. That means us. And the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the mystery is that God has fulfilled his promise to bring salvation into the world through Jesus, and that salvation is for both Jew and Gentile, for everyone. Now to us, this sounds like, well, duh, of course it's for everyone. <laughs> but not in that day and that time. And that day and that time, this is revolutionary because it would have been assumed then that different people groups had their own different gods, that different cultures had their own religious systems, and they didn't mix. Paul says all that changes with this mystery because the mystery is that Christ is for all, his salvation is for all. Now, the implications are really stunning. If you think about our world today, what are the issues, the great issues of our world? Don't they all swirl around division and enmity and hostility, racism, and on and on and on, the things that separate people from each other? This, Paul is saying that, that not only are we as individuals no longer alienated from a holy God, we are also no longer alienated from each other. The gospel is not intended to exclude, it's intended to include. In fact, Christianity, properly understood, is the most inclusive faith system in the history of the world because it's built around grace. Thirdly, the mystery is that Christ is the hope of glory. Human beings have always wondered about what comes next. When your physical body dies, they put you in the ground, what's next? 
Is there life after death? How can you know? How can you experience it? How are you going to make, make sure you're, you, you have it? That's why the ancient Egyptian pharaohs built a giant pyramid. They're preparing for the next life, what they thought might happen. Paul is saying the mystery is no longer unknown. It's been made known. Hope for life after death, hope for glory, that's what that word means, is not found in the mysteries of Gnostic philosophy, but in Christ, his cross, his resurrection, his guarantee of eternal life. So the mystery is Christ, and that mystery has now been made known, Paul says. Secondly, he talks about new life in Christ. New life in Christ. Back in September, I think it was, uh, my wife and I decided we were going to remulch part of our yard, you know, where, where the sh shrubberies are and stuff like that, and uh, because we hadn't done it in a long time. But that meant first we had to do the weeding. We had to get the weeds out first before you put the new mulch down, and both of us hate to weed. But we rolled over our sleeves, put on our gloves, went out there and spent a day pulling out all the weeds. We got that done and started to remulch. But then I realized there, there was this one bush this scrubby little bush that was planted years ago in our front yard that my wife continually uh, commented on how ugly it had, it had become. This part of it had died, it got kind of unruly, kind of, it just wasn't very, very attractive. And of course, I can just ignore it and I don't pay attention. But she kept saying it was ugly, so I eventually discerned there was a message in there for me <laughs> that she would like to have that removed. So because her love language is Acts of service, I decided one day I was going to, while she was out, I was, I'm going to tackle this bush. I'm going to get this bush out. So I chopped it all down right to the ground, but there, then there were the roots I had to get out. And this, this little, little shrub had just enormous roots. And I'm digging and digging and hacking and hacking and wanting to get it done before she comes home. And I can't get the, it won't come out. So I finally just, uh, just chopped off the roots as deep as I could get them and pulled that thing out. And I left the rest of the roots in the ground. There's just too many of them. They're just too deep. And I just covered it over, put the mulch on top, and I'm good. And I imagine that 20 years from now, somebody's going to live in my house. I don't know, 25 years from now. And that, that shrub's going to start growing back. <laughs> and I'm going to go, that's not my problem anymore, buddy. You've got to figure out how to get that one out. But Paul says here, he talks about roots. He says, so then, verse 6, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Notice, not, not learning about him, but live in him. The word he means actually to walk with him. He's implying a dynamic sort of personal relationship. Verse 7, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. And remember that maze I was talking about with all the voices? Paul is writing this 2,000 years ago, and he could be writing to us today. In particular, he could be writing to the younger people among us. Let me speak to just for a moment. To, if you're in, if you're in uh, middle school or you're in high school, <coughs> you're heading off to college someday, maybe you're in college, unless you go to a gospel-centered evangelical university, from the time you set foot on campus at a secular state university, you're going to be told every single day in a hundred ways that Everything you learned about God growing up in your family and in your church, everything you learned about Jesus, everything you learned about faith is wrong. That's what you're going to be taught. You're going to be taught every day that everything you learned is wrong. And you're going to be pushed, bombarded with, and expected to accept what I call spiritual correctness in our culture today. And that's this, that every faith system is the same. They're all going to the same place. So whatever your truth is, is your truth, and that's cool. Paul says, no, no, be rooted, drive your roots deeply into the truth of Christ. Now, here's why, verse 9, for, the, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity, that's God, lives in bodily form. So philosophy and spiritual things aren't separated from the physical. Remember they said that Jesus couldn't be God because God would never have a body. Paul says, no, God came in the flesh so we could know what he looks like and trust what he's done for us. Sink your roots deeply into that truth. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by hands. I'll pause there. Paul switches gears here. He's no longer talking about the Gnostics. He's talking about Jewish traditions now. Circumcision was a Jewish tradition. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, 
in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Now he's switched from this Jewish tradition, ritual of circumcision, to the Christian symbol of baptism, having died and been born again into newness of life. Verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And then this verse, I wish I had more time. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, we don't recognize this language, but Paul is using language that that is describing sort of a military victory parade. In the ancient world, when a conquering general would take, would, would capture a city, he would parade back all the captives in front of his town so he could, they could see he was the victor. He won. He defeated the enemy. That's the image here. We are not only forgiven. Jesus not only forgives us our sin, he destroys our sin. Absolutely, utterly, and finally. So, when Paul says... Continue to live in him or to walk in him. He's saying two things. First, be rooted and built up in the truth of the gospel. Sink your roots into the truth of the gospel. And then he's saying you are alive with Christ. You have new life and new identity. Now, I'm sure some of you, maybe most of you, have heard and seen in social media uh, the recent spiritual conversion of Kanye West. Seen that story? Anybody paid attention to that? I'm not the biggest, you know, you may be surprised I'm not, not, the, not the biggest rap and hip-hop fan in the world, but did a little reading, and for the past decade or so, Kanye West has been one of the most successful recording artists in the whole world. Sold over 20 million albums, over 100 million digital downloads. He has 27 million Twitter followers. And he's known mostly for his um, really basically obscene uh, rap lyrics and some of his most popular stuff. But he recently announced publicly that he's become a born-again follower of Jesus. In fact, he just released an album this past week called Jesus is King. You may have seen that. It's led to an avalanche of reactions. I read an article in a publication called uh, National Review, which is not a Christian publication. The headline of the article was Kanye West's conversion could be a cultural wrecking ball. Continued the the author. uh, says the lyrics in each song The lyrics to each song in Jesus is King are shockingly Christian. (laughs) Did you know that our faith is shockingly, it's shocking to the world. The author quotes from a song called God Is. Here's the lyrics. You won't ever be the same when you call on Jesus' name. Now I was going to rap this for you, but I don't think I can (laughs) pull it off. Listen to the words I'm saying. Jesus saved me. Now I'm saying, and I know, I know God is the force that picked me up. I know Christ is the fountain that filled my cup. The author then continues, Wes seems to be now rejecting the hypersexualization of culture that he admitted he helped create. He claims he's now living his life for Christ and against culture. The man who once said, I am a God, now says Jesus is God. Now again, all kinds of reactions from the very skeptical, maybe for good reason, to the celebratory, also for good reason. But my favorite reaction I saw on Twitter, I don't know who posted this, I tried to find it again, but somebody posted this. Why would I be surprised that Jesus saved Kanye West? I'm actually more surprised that he saved me. I like that. Paul's saying that like Kanye West, you were dead. I was dead. We were dead in sin, what he calls the flesh. Unlike the Gnostics who taught that, you, you, that as long as you had you know, a philosophical, spiritual knowledge, it didn't matter what you did in your body because they're separate, two separate things. Paul says, no, no, no. How you live matters. What you do with your body matters. Because as followers of Jesus, our lives, our bodies, are to reflect his grace, his love, and his holiness to the world. That's how people know what he's like. He says, you have been, you were dead, now you've been made alive with Christ. Forgiven, but more than that, because Jesus has triumphed, has destroyed sin and death, you now are free. And that's the third point we want to talk about today. Freedom through Christ. I'm going to read one more long passage, so hang with me. We're going to get to the point. Verse 16, Paul continues to write, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Now he's talking now about the Jewish traditions and pagan traditions. Sabbaths and new moons. These are other religious ideas. 
These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. There's that phrase again, in, not about, but in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions. By their unspiritual mind, they have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. He's talking about the church as the body of Christ there. Verse 20, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of the world, that's all those other voices, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, he's talking about religious rituals, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Now, let me try to explain all of that. How many of you uh, paid attention to the World Series, Baseball World Series? You know, the one in which the Cubs did not play this year, okay? <laughs> I did too. Well, at some point I saw this little article asking a question, uh, how many uh, future Hall of Famers are playing, were playing in this year's World Series? And as part of that article, they said in 1932, in the World Series in 1932, which was between the Cubs and the Yankees, uh, there were 14 Hall of Famers playing in that one World Series. Think about that, that's like seven out of nine on both sides. That's amazing. But it got me thinking about the Hall of Fame. Uh, and I started thinking, what if, what if there existed something called the Great Husbands Hall of Fame? <laughs> Guys, if there was a, imagine that the criteria for enshrinement forever, you know, with your, your statue of your head, you know, <laughs> in the Great Husbands Hall of Fame, the, the criteria were you had to do three things every day. These three things. You had to tell your wife you love her, you have to give her at least one compliment, and you have to do something to help out around the house. Those are the three requirements to become enshrined forever in the Great Husbands Hall of Fame. Guys, if that were true, what, what, what would we do? I'll tell you what I would do. Here's what I would do if that was true. I'd wake up every day, and before even getting out of bed, <laughs> I would look over and say, morning, I love you, check. <laughs> you look nice for a sleepy person, check. Then I go take a shower, I throw my towel in the hamper, check, 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 boom, I'm going to the Good Husband's Hall of Fame, right? <laughs> now, is that what my wife wants? Some of you are thinking, well, it'd be a start. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think she wants, uh, I think she wants more than that. I think she wants my heart, because marriage isn't a checklist, is it? It's not a checklist like that, it's a relationship. I don't empty the dishwasher when I see the little light on. I don't empty the dishwasher because I'm trying to get into the Great Husband's Hall of Fame, even though I'm pretty darn good at it. I'm not. I do it because I'm in a relationship because I love my wife, and because in a sense, listen, in a sense, my life is hidden with hers because of the covenant we made. My life is hidden in hers, and hers in mine. It's not about religious rituals. Paul's talking about the gospel, he's talking about a relationship. He says, don't let anyone judge you, and don't judge yourselves by religious rules and rituals. It's not about that. He says, they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. In other words, religion, hear me clearly, religion, the rules and rituals based in religion have no power to change your life because they can't change who you are. Only Jesus can change who we are because of who he is. Now, Paul's going to get really practical in the next couple of chapters, starting in chapter 3. He's going to talk about things like family life, about relationships. But what he's doing here is showing you, before you talk about how you live, before you can change how you live, you have to change who you are. And Jesus changes who we are because of who he is. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the mystery of God made known. He has canceled, canceled, destroyed our sin and even death. In him, we have new life, new hearts, new identity, new purpose, new destiny. So Paul says, with all the confusing voices in the world, everybody's shouting different things at you. Listen to one voice. Listen to the one voice that is above all things. We're going to finish our service today with communion, as we, and as we do here at uh, Mill Creek, you'll be handed in a few moments uh, trays with two cups stacked together. Take both cups, hold them until everybody has them, and then I will lead us in the remembrance of bread and cup. 
And if you're a newcomer here, maybe this is your first Sunday, if you put your faith in Jesus, you're welcome to share the bread and cup with us here this morning. So let's bow in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for your word today. Thank you for this ancient letter written to people so different from us, but so much like us, also living in a culture filled with different voices, confusing voices. People needing to be rooted in truth and grace. So today we come to your table, to these two little symbols, bread and cup, that remind us who you are and what you do for us. And we acknowledge today that you are above all things. Remind us again through bread and cup. In Jesus' name we pray.